This morning I wanted to talk about expectations. We all have preconceived ideas about how things work or should work and what should happen. And I couldn't think of a better example of expectations than this. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, some of you are already getting the point just from seeing this logo. We have expectations uh, based on how we would like to see things happen, right? So for the bombers, uh, each season we hold out great hopes that the rebuilding years are over. We look great on paper this year, we say, at the start of the season. They sure changed things in the back office this year, didn't they? And on and on it goes until you get into game three, then five, and eight games into the season. And I took a random survey <laughs> of the 2014 season. This random survey was conducted. Uh, it's accurate, an accurate representation of the enthusiasm of the average Bomber fan at 27 Everingham Bay in Winnipeg. Uh, the survey is accurate nine times out of ten, plus or minus five percent, and honestly, I don't have a clue what I just said, because I've heard that around surveys, but I don't really know what it means. <laughs> but you can see that we have wins, or cumulative wins on the side, and then we have fan enthusiasm that's also measured uh, on the y-axis for you uh, who know math and stats. Uh, and you'll see that we start at 10 out of 10 fan enthusiasm, right? And as we progress through the season, we get the number of games played along the bottom. What happens to our fan enthusiasm? Well, it's pretty good right at the start. We had three wins and then a loss. And the cumulative wins are adding up to, we get to five. And then we just kind of stalled out six and, and we get to nine or six games. And then it just flatlines. And what does that do to our enthusiasm? And the point I wanted to make was expectations don't create reality with things you can't control. So let's talk about expectations. A uh, little switch of gears here, but the, the time of Christmas, there's no better time to talk about expectations. So let's just take a little survey here. It might be a break from school or work. That's your expectation. What's another expectation? Well, totally functional family relationships. How, how about that for a lofty expectation? The perfect gift. Christmas will make everything good. And peace on earth, goodwill to men. Well, it seems, maybe it's just me, that, uh, but every year I seem to get sucked into the the pre-Christmas vortex that promises uh, that Christmas will somehow be the event, the big reprieve, the time that all worries will melt away and be re replaced by that peace on earth. But Christmas is not an end in and of itself. It is just a reminder. And the point that I wanted to make is that expectations don't create reality with things you partially influence. Most of those Christmas expectations were you only had partial influence, or maybe none at all. So it was interesting this morning, um, we were listening to CBC Radio, and uh, they were talking about expectations. It was very timely. And they, they had this one phrase that kind of caught my attention and Joyce's attention. Good enough is the new perfect. You know, some of, sometimes we just need to relax. Good enough is the new perfect. But I also liked one other thing they said. It is hard to be anxious when you are grateful. I just wanted to change a little bit, and I'm going to change out of character. So, I'd hope to have a youth do this, but I'll do it myself. This morning, I couldn't find a youth to do it. My name is John the Baptist, and I was given a great mission, even before I was born. In fact, God sent an angel to speak to my father to let him know that I would be born. Now, that is amazing all by itself, 
But even more amazing is that my parents were very old when God said that I would be born. God said that I would be a joy and a delight and that many would rejoice because I was born. When I was born, my dad sang a song that promised deliverance for the Jewish people and that we would be rescued from our enemies. So what was the big deal? Why was I so important? Well, I am Jewish and my task was to announce and pave the way for the Lord, the Messiah, the Savior of my people. My people, the Jews, had been exiled and kicked around by various superpowers for the past millennium. Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Medes, Greeks, Romans. God used to send prophet guys to speak to us. Even though the news wasn't that promising, at least he was speaking to us. But before I was born, God had not spoken directly through a prophet for 400 years. We were all desperate for a little good news and a serious beatdown of the opposition. The Romans had been particularly nasty and were the oppressive flavor of the day. I took my role very seriously and people really listened to me. Maybe it was the wild hair and clothes that I wore, or maybe it was the food, locusts and honey. But the people really got excited about the Savior that I was talking about, and many thought I was the Savior. The real Savior I was talking about was Jesus Christ. I was not even worthy to tie his shoes. He was the one, the Messiah, or so I thought. Jesus started his ministry, and I thought, great, here we go. We're going to overthrow the Romans. Give them what they deserve, Jesus. But then I landed in jail for speaking the truth about one of the Roman leaders. Was I going to miss the big overthrow? How could this happen to me? And Jesus just kept doing miracles and healing people. He sent out his disciples and told them, All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. When I heard that, I thought that maybe I had been wrong, so I sent my disciples to Jesus to ask him, Are you the Messiah who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? I wanted to read uh, Matthew 11, 1 to 3. It's uh, not on the screen. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? John the Baptist had expectations. And they were far from being met because he had radically different expectations. And who could blame him? He didn't end up in a very good spot, ending up in prison when he was supposed to pave the way for the Savior. John thought that he would witness the culmination of redemption for the Jews, the big overthrow. But what he was missing was that he was playing a role in a much broader story. God was breaking into history by sending his son, to become man, so that he could walk among us, have a relationship with us, and ultimately redeem us through his death. Without Christ's birth, he could not have conquered sin through his death. And here comes the opportunity for those from zero to ten. If you're not using the notes, the handout for the sermon, I want you to draw, draw either John the Baptist or Mr. Wes. And you can hand me the picture afterwards. And it'll make me feel good, maybe not the picture you draw, but to see you looking up and then looking down. And, and I'll think you're taking notes. And so I'll feel good about myself. So the youth, how does this apply to us? 
The youth have highlighted ministers, ministries that they are currently involved in or have been involved in. Ministry can be difficult, and certainly if we have expectations that are unrealistic, we can be very disappointed. We must recognize that we are just part of a much bigger story, and that's not to minimize what we are doing. When we look around at our nation and the seemingly helpless slide away from God and the story of Christ, it can be disheartening. And sometimes we expect Christmas to fix that, to be a reprieve from the sense that good is losing the battle. It is important to make a difference where we live. But remember that we are much part of a much bigger story. So this morning I would like to remind us that Christmas is not the event and is not an end in and of itself. It is just a reminder of when Christ broke into our world to bring redemption. Christ is the one. And we don't need to pin our hopes on Christmas. We don't need to be disappointed with what the world looks like right now, like John the Baptist did. We need to keep being involved in ministry, but it is not dependent on us. The story of redemption and salvation is happening. And we are playing a part in that story. The story of Christ. Christ is the one. And expectations that are based on certainty never disappoint. And Christ is that certainty. I wanted to read... It's not often, I suspect, uh, that a message around Christmas time comes from Revelation. But I wanted to read from Revelation 12, 1 to 5. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. When I was uh, in school, and that would have been shortly after John the Baptist, um, I, I always appreciated when the teacher said, I'm going to read you a story. Pens down, you don't need to take notes, it's not on the test. And I thought because uh, Kids for Christ isn't in session this morning, I would take the opportunity to read a story, and it's based on what I've just read, Revelations 12. 1 to 5. And I thought it might make it a little more realistic. I know Dave has to pin himself down on a chair so he won't wander. But I thought, reading a story, well, you just got to read it from a chair. This reading is uh, from Dr. David Jeremiah's book, Agents of the Apocalypse. And as I was thinking about the message, you know, I, I could have written lots of words but I couldn't think of a, a better way than what he's done to describe uh, the story that's unfolding. And it's from a different perspective than maybe what you would have thought from, uh, um, for a Christmas uh, message. But here we go. Golden light danced around the angels as they gathered in the second heaven. The vast assembly waited expectantly as Lucifer, the greatest and most beautiful of the archangels, made his way to the front. In moments, he would take his seat at the head of the great angelic congress to report God's latest instructions to them. But instead of mounting the steps to the marble days, Lucifer took aside his closest aide, Michael, an archangel like himself. The Congress will have to wait, Lucifer said. Dismiss the assembly. We must speak immediately. Michael made the announcement and the gathering dispersed, leaving the two archangels standing alone. Michael could see by Lucifer's dark countenance that he was not here to discuss a light matter. You're troubled, Lucifer. What has happened? As you know, I have just returned from the high heaven where God is enthroned. He has revealed to me his most recent project, a vast and daring one, 
He's created a new physical world beneath the lowest heaven. It is utterly glorious. Perhaps the most beautiful thing he's ever made aside from ourselves. He is populating this world with a new race of creatures. And he has modeled them after himself, granting them intelligence, free will, and creativity. He will charge them with the rule and care of his new world and infuse them with his own spirit. Lucifer, you baffle me. Why is that not good news? Why does it disturb you? Why does it disturb me? I'll tell you why, Lucifer shouted. God wants us, his angels, to minister to these new creatures. We're to be messengers to them, protecting them and assisting them in their little endeavors. How can he expect us, the highest order of creatures in all of the universe, to stoop so low as to become errand runners and servants to inferior beings? We should be ruling them, not serving them. I tell you, Michael, this is not to be tolerated. A short time later, Lucifer reconvened the great council of all the angels. When they were assembled, he mounted the steps to the days and addressed the legions of mighty things before him. He first explained the new assignment God had charged them with, and then to their amazement, he spewed out his disdain. We run God's errands. We watch over and protect his creation. Why should we be required to forever submit to his will and stifle our own? I tell you, my oppressed comrades, we must not accept this degradation any longer. Hear me, and hear me well. We possess the power to seize the throne of God. Michael positioned in the first tier behind, uh, beneath the days, stepped forward immediately. My dear captain, think about what you are saying. Have you forgotten who we are? Like these newly formed earth beings, we too are God's creation. He gave us a vital role in his universal kingdom and made us find joy in serving him. Who are we to defy our creator? As the debate between the two mighty archangels escalated, so did Lucifer's rage. His rising anger began to infect some of the angels in the assembly, and as, as he ranted on, the rebels' cries swelled until a great chorus of voices echoed their leader's outrage. Such vocal support bolstered Lucifer's belief that he had won the unwavering loyalty of the other angels. At last he raised his hand and the entire host fell silent. Your affirmation confirms that you're with me. Therefore I call all of you to battle, he commanded. We will depose that arrogant tyrant who humiliates and oppresses us. We will take his throne and we will make his high heavens our dwelling place. Are you with me? His words were met by a roar of assent. Lucifer, however, had miscalculated his support. The angels who had cheered him on were merely the most vocal ones, numbering only about one-third of the whole. But Lucifer remained undeterred, assembling his army and leading the march forward. He immediately found his way barred by Michael, who had rallied the rest of the angels against him. The two armies clashed in a titanic supernatural battle. Michael's army drove the rebels back and hurled them from the second heaven. The fallen leader heard the voice of Michael speak from high above. Lucifer, you've been my friend, and it grieves me deeply that you have severed our unity. You have chosen hatred over love, pride over humility, evil over good, and darkness over light. Therefore God has decreed that your name shall no longer be Lucifer, the bearer of light. From this day forward you shall be called Satan, the adversary. No longer will you be a creature of love and beauty. You will be a dragon, a hated, loathsome creature, whose utterances and deceptions will deliver those who heed you into eternal fire. In an instant, a smoldering Satan sat brooding beside a stream on the newly created planet. One thought obsessed him. How can I spite God and regain power? After a great deal of scheming, he arose and called his lieutenants to him. He presented a detailed plan by which they could wrest from God the new world he had made, annihilate its inhabitants, and make it their own domain. While it is much too small a kingdom for a being of my stature, he bragged, it will serve as a power base from which we can launch subsequent attacks until we have wrenched the entire universe from the hand of God. But how can we do this? One of his minions asked. He told us that God has placed his own spirit within the two humans. That gives them power we cannot overcome. Satan smirked. When God explained this new creation to me, he said that if the human couple ever disobeyed him, his spirit would depart 
and they would die. Our task then is to get the man and woman to disobey God. I will deceive them into thinking he is not their benefactor, but a selfish tyrant. Satan left his lieutenants and, dis- and disguised himself as one of the more cunning earthly creatures. And using a mix of lies and half-truths, he seduced the people into rejecting their creator. But to his consternation, they did not immediately die. God confronted them with their disobedience and revealed the pain, sorrow, and death that would come as a result. But he also promised something their seducer had never anticipated, that one of their future descendants would restore all they had lost and would crush Satan's head. When Satan heard this prophecy, new outrage boiled in his heart. He charged the full battalion of his fierce demons to conduct a guerrilla war to prevent the promised Redeemer from coming. Throughout the centuries, they attacked the family, the kings, and the nation charged with bringing God's promise to fruition. But neither Satan nor his legions could keep the promised child from being born. It was in the reign of the Roman Emperor Tiberius when Satan's battalion leader came to him with news that a man named Jesus had just been baptized in the Jordan River. What makes you think he is the one? Satan asked, already knowing the answer. When he emerged from the water, a voice from heaven proclaimed him to be God's own son. For 30 years, he was known simply as Jesus of Nazareth. But his true identity has now been revealed. This Jesus is the one we have been fearfully awaiting. The devil immediately transported himself to the Jordan. He arrived to see Jesus walking alone in the barren wilderness between, the Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. Satan followed him until he stopped on a desolate plain where no vegetation grew. For 40 days he watched as Jesus fasted and prayed. The adversary thought to himself, now that he's weak and hungry, he will grasp at anything I offer. To Satan's surprise, Jesus offered no resistance as he approached. It is written, Jesus told his tempter, man shall not live by bread alone. And he tempted him a second time. Once again, Jesus refused. And finally, Satan took him to a high mountain where he conjured up a panoramic vista revealing all the great kingdoms of the world. As he swept his arm over the magnificent view that lay below them, he said, all this is yours to rule if you will but fall down right now and worship me. Then in a voice charged with power and authority, Jesus said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. When Satan returned and sat before his council, no one dared ask if his attack had been successful. The fear on his face told them everything they needed to know. The council sat silent and wary until their leader addressed them. There's no doubt that this Jesus is indeed the Son of God. If we do not get rid of him, and soon every plot we have devised since our exile will come to nothing. Worse, if this Christ comes to power, he will seek to drive us from this world as we were driven from the heavens. A voice from among the gathered demons moaned, everything we've tried has failed. What else can we do? We can change our tactics, Satan replied. Since we cannot prevail against Jesus directly, we must work covertly. We know from God's prophecy to Adam and Eve and others that Jesus is the Messiah, sent to save humanity from the death he inflicted on them. If we can deceive the Jews about his purpose and make them doubt that he is their promised Messiah, they will turn against him. But how will we do that? One of Satan's henchmen asked. We must use the national and religious pride of their leaders, especially the Pharisees, so that they perceive Jesus not as the Messiah, but as a fraud, out to undermine their power. No doubt he will try to gain their support with wise words and miracles. So we must blind their eyes to the good he does and make them envy his growing popularity. Nothing infuriates a Pharisee so much as the thought of someone usurping his influence. The Jewish leaders were indeed easy to manipulate. A spark of jealousy over Jesus' growing influence had already ignited in their hearts. And for the next three years, Satan and his followers fanned that flame into a a burning passion for Jesus' death. The devil saw victory looming on the horizon. Determined not to let it slip from his fingers, he entered the fray himself, inciting the avarice of one of Christ's closest companions. It was the night of the Jewish Passover feast when the dragon made his move. As Jesus arrived at Mount Olivet with three of his disciples to pray, the very atmosphere felt ominous. Satan could see legions upon legions of angels hovering low over the mountain. 
While Jesus prayed, Satan persuaded Judas to lead an armed band of Jewish officials to Mount Olivet. Once there, he was to identify his master with a kiss of greeting. Satan had found nothing to celebrate since his fall, but the irony of using a kiss, an expression of love, as an act of betrayal was the closest he'd come yet. Jesus was arrested on the spot and taken directly to Annas, the high priest, for trial. At Satan's prompting, the high priest put Jesus through a sham of a trial using false witnesses and trumped up charges. Then Annas sent him for final judgment to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. The following morning, Jesus was brought before Pilate on the step of the Roman garrison, the Antonia Fortress. A restless mob of Jews had already assembled to watch the proceedings. Satan knew that Pilate was weak. He was afraid of offending the emperor and losing his position, and equally afraid of offending the Jews and causing a riot. It soon became apparent that he did not want to execute Jesus. Instead, he attempted to appease the bloodlust of the Jewish leaders by having Jesus scourged and then released. Satan sounded the alarm to his troops. Quick, descend en masse into that mob. Stir them into a frenzy of hate. I want them so enraged that the governor fears an outright insurrection. The demons did their job. Soon the air rang with furious voices shouting for blood. As their master expected, Pilate yielded to the pressure and gave Jesus over to the Jews to be crucified. As Jesus writhed on the cross, Satan gloated in triumph when he heard God's own son cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And finally watched his tortured body amid a last rasping breath. Satan's exaltation knew no bounds. Satan gloried in the finality of it all. He had succeeded in thwarting God's plan. Humanity would not be redeemed. Their champion had been destroyed. The earth was ripe for the taking. Satan burst into a spasm of laughter that rang long and loud through the halls of hell. Three days later, while Satan was conducting a mass assembly for his fallen angels, a sharp noise like a fierce wind interrupted his words. Its volume increased until it became almost unbearable. A blinding blur of light rushed over them and exploded through the massive gates, shattering, scattering shards of stone and splinters of mighty beams. All that was left of the gates of hell was a gaping hole that was now belching black smoke. The force of the impact knocked all the demons to the ground. Shrieks of terror filled the hall as they lay there cowering, too afraid to rise. Cease your howling and pull yourselves together, Satan bellowed. Jesus has escaped, and death, our most potent weapon, has been wrested from us. We could not hold the master of life. He has broken the chains of death. You can be sure that he will now reunite with his body and break out of the tomb in the same way. What can we do, one of the demons cried. First, we must face reality. Satan's voice was grim. We cannot win against God. Even if we slaughtered the humans and flung their rotting carcasses all over the globe, Jesus would simply resurrect them as he has been resurrected. Our doom is sealed. But here's what we can do. Satan's voice grew louder. We may go down in the end, but we'll, we will leave a wound on God by taking down as many of his precious humans as possible. We can still make their lives miserable. We can still fill them with disease, grief, pain, and conflict and for some eternal death. We must stifle all thought of our inevitable end and re redouble our efforts to spite the God we hate. And that's the world that we live in. The world where Satan is trying to thwart us, our ministry efforts, our relationships, and even to destroy Christmas, which is now popularly called Xmas. How can that be? <laughs> It's Christmas. And I wanted to note that Christ is the one who broke the power of Satan forever. Christ is the one. Christmas is not the event, not an end in and of itself. Christmas is just the reminder of when Christ broke into our world to bring redemption. Christ is the one and we don't need to pin our hopes on Christmas. We don't need to be disappointed with what the world looks like right now like John the Baptist did. Or maybe some of us are discouraged by what the world looks like. The story of redemption and salvation is happening, and we are playing a part in that history. The story of Christ. Christ is the one. Let's pray. 
God, we thank you that you sent your Son and that Christmas is that reminder where Christ broke in to, redemption, or to redeem us. And we thank you for this time that we can remember that. And we pray that you will touch our hearts today with the message that we are just part of the big story that you are working out every day in this world. And we rely on you and that our expectations, when they're built on certainty, the certainty that you uh, were born, you died, and that you're coming again, well, that expectation can always be met. We pray that you will help us through this week and the coming weeks as we go from this church. Amen.